I'm Susan McClary. I'm a professor of musicology at UCLA. I've been here for 13 years. Before I came here, I taught at the University of Minnesota and at McGill University in Montreal. I got into musicology uh, in a rather interesting way, and this will explain a lot of the, the rather strange directions I have pursued. I was being trained as a piano major at Southern Illinois University. I had listened to classical music from the crib. My father wanted to saturate me with classical music. There was never a time when I didn't know all of the Beethoven symphonies, all of the Brahms symphonies, and so on. And when I started college, I actually felt that I could tell what was going on in anything in the common practice repertory and very quickly became sought after as a coach for performers, string quartets or singers who wanted uh, someone to help them figure out how to make sense of a score would come to me. And I was uh, doing that really at a very early age. Uh, it was quite extraordinary. Then I took my first music history class and I encountered early music. I never heard anything like this. It puzzled me, it delighted me, and I thought probably what musicologists did was to figure out how that music worked, uh, how I could approach it in the same way I approached Bach or Mozart. And so I went off to graduate school at Harvard thinking that's what I would do. Well, musicology at that time had almost nothing to do with music. You could be a, an archivist and go off and find uh, facts about the production of music. You could edit music because we have an enormous backlog of music from the past that has never made it even today into uh, performing editions that most musicians can read. But you couldn't really deal with the music itself. And I felt, even at that time, and when I was coaching Bach or Mozart, I always felt that one had to be able to connect the music to its historical moment, that styles were not arbitrary, uh, that you had to have some sense of what the aesthetic and expressive priorities were at each moment in order to make sense of scores and then to translate them into sound. So I've always been working in an intersection among perform uh, between performance, uh, music theory and analysis, and history and culture. I've never known how to divide those apart from each other. Uh, I still don't. I don't know how I would do any of my work if I didn't know how to do that. But in graduate school, I was told that we don't deal with the music itself. Uh, we are learning how to be archivists. So I would work in my classes and I would pretend to be doing a dissertation on archival work. And then I would go down with a score in the basement to try to figure out what it made it tick. And hours later, they would throw me out of the building because they were going to close it down. I would re realize once again that I'd been carried away uh, with the music and I wasn't supposed to do that. It was a terrible guilty pleasure, this music stuff. When I finally got my degree and began to teach, I started trying to implement the way I had thought music studies ought to be carried out all the way along. That is the very uh, uh, stringent intersection among performance, music theory and analysis, history and culture. Uh, and I began teaching that way. Um, I also tried writing that way. And no one in any of the music disciplines recognized what I was writing as being something they could deal with. You know, the music theorists would say, that's musicology. The musicologists would say, that's music theory. And I continued to work in this area until I began to get involved with interdisciplinary centers. This was in the mid-1980s. And I found that uh, the Center for Humanistic Studies and the Center for the Study of Women at the University of Minnesota both had very, very exciting intellectuals working cutting-edge theories. 
and that finally I had ways of trying to put these things together. Uh, I would pop up in their conferences and I would say, well, you know, in music it also works that way, and they would think, who let her in? <laughs> what does music have to do with anything we're talking about? But then they be would become very excited. Um, so I became sort of the token musician in a lot of interdisciplinary programs and eventually was heading these programs. Uh, I think I was so invested in finding a way of making sense of my view of the world that I was willing to put more energy into those uh, enterprises than anyone else. And um, it was in those contexts, in interdisciplinary contexts, that my work began to be published. Uh, when it began to be published in feminist journals, in cultural critique, in places like that, uh, suddenly there was a buzz about it. And people in music studies had to pay attention to it. Uh, they uh, weren't very happy about it uh, to start with, but uh, it really changed the face of musicology. And I'm very pleased to say that I've been welcomed back into the official discipline of music theory now. I'm being invited to uh, do seminars uh, in music theory uh, symposia and things of that sort. So I think that that vision of uh, insisting that, uh, that performance of music, the analysis of music, the historical and cultural dimensions of music must always be integrated, has become now accepted across a very wide group of people. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to see this. So many of the things that otherwise just pass as playing the notes on the page, just a mechanical exercise, how to execute those, how to make sure you're playing in tune. Sometimes that is, uh, is what musicians think their task is. Uh, don't make mistakes. Make it as beautiful as possible. When you understand the context within which the music was composed, the aesthetic priorities, the sorts of even cultural tensions that are uh, articulated in the music, the uh, ability to perform, uh, I think, rises exponentially. To take something like the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, for instance, we're very accustomed to thinking of the last movement uh, as the Ode to Joy. There is a hymn that many people sing in church services in English uh, that just has the tune. And the, the use of the Ninth Symphony uh, politically uh, for purposes of celebration, such as the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, has made people hear that piece in exclusively celebratory terms. Now, in order to hear it that way, you have to ignore a lot of the things that made that piece so difficult to play when it was first performed. Uh, it was regarded even as unperformable for uh, quite a long time after the premiere. Um, and it was thought to be that way, not just because of the enormous performing forces that it takes, but also because of the ruptures that take place, because of the really shocking events. We begin the symphony with a dissonance that screams after a very, very placid, a uh, beautiful third movement. The scream erupts. Now, we're used to that because we've heard the Ninth Symphony millions of times. We're also accustomed to the fact that as it tries to come to a conclusion, it keeps almost stopping and then breaking down, almost stopping, then breaking down, almost stopping, breaking down, and finally just shoving for conclusion. Now, this is not the way a piece ought to work. And I think when you're able to talk to people who are performing, who are conducting, but even, you know, the person who is playing uh, last chair, second fiddle, uh, to understand uh, the way that Beethoven is trying, in a way, to, to perform once again the confidence he had in the Enlightenment when he wrote the Eroica Symphony. Uh, but he is now riddled with doubt. Many things have happened in Europe uh, and in his own life uh, in, the, in the course of the intervening years. Uh, 
And so these places where the piece almost falls apart, where it is almost ripped down the middle, are as important as the places where it seems to be completely coherent. Uh, it has to be a balance between those, between uh, the rejoicing and the hymn singing and the places where it suddenly breaks off into nowhere with question marks hanging all around. Now you can perform the Ninth Symphony, uh, uh, and many people do, by trying to push through those question marks, trying to make uh, some kind of smooth entity of the whole movement. And that certainly works well for celebration. But uh, the impact that you can have when you perform the doubt, when you perform the desire, uh, and yet the doubts that this world genuinely still exists, uh, is, uh, is just extraordinary. And I think anyone going into a performance of a piece that is that complex needs to have ways of thinking about why this movement is shaped so very strangely, or even have it be pointed out to them that the movement is shaped strangely because we're so familiar with it. We don't even notice anymore. I sometimes tell my students who want there to be a single right way of performing a piece of classical music. Uh, that, that is probably the wrong question. There have been hundreds, thousands of productions of Hamlet, each one with a completely different take on that very, very complex text, each one imagining a different motivation for Hamlet, a different motivation for Ophelia. And we go to see productions of Hamlet not because it will duplicate the one that Laurence Olivier did on film, but because it will give us new insights. It will cause us to see not only Hamlet differently, but will allow us to experience our own lives in a different way. And that's what the performance of a great piece of classical music ought to do also. That's why I think that we have to think about what is being said? What, what is the nature of uh, the meaning of these pieces? And how is that meaning being articulated in the very smallest details of articulation, of bowing, of, of dynamic uh, uh, marks, or, or anything else? I think all of these things must be brought together. I would say that the interpretation of music takes place in, in very different places, and all of them are valid. Uh, in many conservatories, uh, students are taught uh, to internalize something that is called musicality. They bring that musicality to the score. Uh, they come up with their own reading. That reading may or may not be informed by the original historical context though it will be informed by uh, the, the historical moment of the performer because that notion of musicality is always marked by the taste of the, the moment, uh, the teachers that person works with, the, the performances that have been attended, the recordings that have been listened to. All of those things create a kind of historical stamp on on, uh, on musicality. We can't escape history. We can, however, uh, come up with very different ways of integrating history, either attempts at thinking what would this have meant in the composer's time, uh, or should we try for a postmodernist deconstruction of this piece, which I think also is, uh, is a very exciting thing to do. But just bringing some kind of frozen notion of musicality to a score um, is, uh, then limits the intellectual engagement uh, in the process of music making. I prefer uh, to think about what the choices are and why I'm making the choices I'm making. Actually, most of my research projects uh, are the results of things I have encountered while I'm sitting at the keyboard, while I'm playing, and I think, why is it doing this? I don't know how to make sense of this.
That drives me into the historical record. I sometimes look at what literary critics have to say about the literature of that time. Uh, I look at it in as many directions as I can. But my questions almost always arise from the music itself. I, don't, I can't think of a project I've ever done where there is an idea and I think, well, what piece could I apply this to? Um, I, I don't work that way. My, my, uh, my juices only start to flow when the music is going. And um, that's why I couldn't possibly let go of, of performance uh, as, as what really drives me into, into the books, uh, into an, a greater analysis, into everything I do. When I approach a score, which is some some version of, 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 of something preserved, but just on, with dots on a page. Um, I always enter with my own reified notion of musicality, I, ha I think I have to say. It's when something occurs that I don't know quite how to make sense of with that pre-canned notion of musicality that I find myself stopping and asking, what kind of psychological uh, situation would have given rise to this, or um, what kind of historical uh, uh, moment I might have thought this was a way of uh, putting music together. Let me give you an example. One of the things that I have been most concerned with in the last few years is French music of the 17th century. Until quite recently, that music was regarded by most people as somehow or other not working the way music is supposed to work. Uh, you will find that statement written even in major textbooks concerning uh, Western music history. You'll get to the 17th century in France and you will say, well, they wrote these little dances but they don't really do much and they but they seem to like them, and so there. And I used to go along with that. I, I specialize in music of the 16th and, 16th and 17th centuries. And I have always found the Italian music much, much more compelling. But I finally decided that I couldn't stand to look at myself in the mirror anymore and say this, that, well, this music somehow or other doesn't work. I mean, what in the world could that possibly mean? Uh, it doesn't mean, it doesn't, it can only mean that it doesn't work in, in accordance with something that I have already assumed in advance as some kind of universal. And obviously the universal doesn't hold if this music doesn't make sense to me. So I set myself the project one summer that I wasn't going to let myself play any other music uh, except these little 17th century French dances for harpsichord. And I played them, and I played them, and I played them. And they s really sounded to me, and I'm afraid to my husband, like nonsense for quite a while. And then something began to click. And I began to uh, find that I would turn to a new dance, and suddenly there would be these amazing details. And I would think, oh my, look at that. Look what it did there. Uh, and. I would figure out what I would need to do to make it audible to a listener what those moments were. What I finally came up with was that French music of that time has a radically different temporality, radically different sense of being in time from its counterparts in either Germany or Italy. If you bring the temporality of Italian music to French music, you just run roughshod all over all of those details. Uh, you come up with nothing except that this music doesn't work. Uh, if, on the other hand, you allow yourself to hover in the timeless state, uh, to hang up on an ornament, uh, to allow the, your virtual body to dance, uh, in this very stylized way that people who study early dance have, are also recovering now. This music is absolutely exquisite. It cannot be translated. It doesn't even travel onto the piano. I will sometimes find, I will bring it into my classes, I don't have a harpsichord handy. I'll think, oh well, I'll just sit down at the piano. And it just sounds awful. Um, 
This music is merciless. It demands exactly the right instruments, exactly the right sounds, exactly the right sense of nuance, exactly the right hovering. It's what the French harpsichordist Francois Couperin called um, or soul. Um, there has to be this bending of, of, the, of the time. If you play metrically, nothing happens. You might say uh, it was a 17th or an 18th or early 18th century version of it ain't got a, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Uh, but he tries to theorize in words exactly how to produce that sense of swing. Uh, for French music. Uh, once you have figured out how to do it, uh, then this can be music you, you never want to do anything else. Um, but it, it was a very difficult conversion process. I had to trust that the musicians in the court of Louis XIV knew what they were doing. And if I didn't get it, it was my fault. Um, and I had to figure out how to get into that landscape, how to look at the paintings of the time, how to read the literature of the time, how even to look at the theology of, of the time uh, and the ways in which uh, mystics describe uh, ex ecstasy and trance. All of those things contributed to my ability to try to reconstruct a kind of temporality that is, is radically different from the ones we have internalized as uh, musicality or the way that music is supposed to go. Improvisation was an absolutely crucial aspect of music in Europe and North America uh, until Around the middle of the 19th century, all musicians uh, learned mostly through apprenticeship. Uh, they would sit in. Uh, as they got older, they would give, be given more and more responsibility in the performances in ensembles. They would be taught to improvise, uh, but uh, the, the music of uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, we know that the scores we have are only blueprints. They're very much like jazz charts. Uh, and that the musicians at the time knew how to take those charts and to fill them out in very, very lavish, sumptuous detail. That begins to break down when the, uh, the classical canon of great works begins to take shape, uh, this occurs in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Uh, until then, people mostly performed contemporary music. It was always new, it was always the, perf the composer was there, the people for whom the music was written were playing it. But uh, with the establishment of the symphony orchestra as uh, an ensemble, with the much larger audiences that are coming into concert halls in the early 19th century uh, with the change of market, suddenly the people who are administering opera houses, concert halls, have to decide uh, how to do programming in order to maximize their, um, their proceeds. Uh, they know that Beethoven is a sure sell. They will uh, put Beethoven symphonies in and then a few things by contemporary composers. Uh, Felix Mendelssohn in uh, 1829 has a series of historical concerts, he calls them, one of which uh, brought the music of Haydn and, uh, and Mozart, the other Handel and Bach back into play. Those musicians uh, were remembered by a few professionals, but they were not uh, really kept alive. Uh, these concerts that Mendelssohn gave were, uh, were tremendously important. So then we have a canon of great German music, uh, with Handel and Bach at one end, then Haydn and Mozart, then Beethoven, then maybe Schumann, Mendelssohn himself, uh, and a few others. But as 
uh, time goes through the 19th century, you have a greater and greater tendency to repeat the pieces that uh, are true uh, hits in, in, the, in the concert repertory. As those pieces then take on the cast of great works, taken out of their uh, original historical contexts, people began to protect them and say, well, we can't add anything to this. This was by Beethoven. This was by Mozart. Uh, and so a kind of hands-off policy begins to surround that music. Um, and more and more uh, young performers who are being trained in conservatories are being trained just to play the scores because we don't want to hear you, we want to hear Schumann, we want to hear Beethoven, not you. Um, well, we know that Franz Liszt was a great, great improviser. Uh, many of the pieces he goes on to publish were, of course, written down improvisations, things that he would do in his, in, in his concertizing. But after that, we have fewer and fewer uh, composers who are themselves matinee idols who are up there improvising and, uh, and, and dazzling the crowds. Um, there are a few places in classical music where improvisation is kept alive. Uh, if you are being trained to be an organist, you are trained to be a very good improviser. And that's because most organists are going to have to play in the churches and they're going to have to know how to fill in the gaps in, uh, in the church service. They have to be very quick on their feet. They don't have a, a preset program they're going to do. But by and large, piano players, and other people who are being taught to be uh, concert musicians, not taught to improvise. Uh, it's you know it's really a great tragedy that uh, all of that potential creativity uh, is no longer encouraged. Um, now, with the early music movement that began in the 1960s and then really developed uh, very powerfully in the 70s and 80s and 90s. We have a lot of young musicians who have decided they want to do early music and who, uh, once again, are learning just to improvise just from the get-go. Uh, they know that in order to play those scores, they're going to have to be able to take the blueprint and fill it out. Um, and a lot of those people are also playing standard repertory, and so it, it, it gets passed around. I, I hope that uh, we will eventually see uh, the, the rebirth of improvisation as a central part of, of the training of all musicians. It's one of the things that I think we're working uh, towards as we're trying to put our School of Music together in a different way here. Recording has, as, as with most technologies, has enormous benefits and some unforeseen uh, disadvantages. Benefits are obvious. A uh, hundred years ago, you could hope to hear a performance of, of a Beethoven symphony once or twice in your life. Uh, you would have to come away with your impression of that piece marked by that one experience. Many pieces you would never ever hear. Uh, we have uh, accounts by Berlioz and people like that who would travel long distances because he heard something was going to be performed and, you know, and he would just kill to, to hear this uh, being done live. We don't have that problem anymore. Uh, we can uh, go onto Amazon and have that whole standard repertory delivered to our doorstep the next day uh, with no problem. We can listen to things infinite numbers of times. We can become familiar with that repertory uh, like almost no one could dream of being. We also now have uh, music from the Middle Ages all the way through to the present available. We have music from all around the globe available. Our, uh, our understanding of music making has expanded uh, you know, just beyond anyone's wildest imagination. At the same time, <clears throat> uh, recording uh, freezes one particular performance. Um, 
And as long as we recognize that, I think it's fine. Um, but uh, recording has sometimes had the effect of leading uh, young musicians, especially potential virtuosos, people who want to have uh, uh, solo careers. It sometimes has the effect of, of discouraging them from taking the kinds of risks that we know live performers uh, were allowed to take all the way through history. Um, they want to sound just like the recording. And recordings have, tr have uh, through splicing, through uh, digital uh, remastering, have come up with, uh, with instances that never existed in the real world. Um, no one ever played as perfectly as the recordings that we hear. So that perfection in execution becomes uh, something that everyone strives for, it, it, but sometimes at the expense of daringness <clears throat> in interpretation. If it doesn't sound like the way the last six recordings of that sonata sounded, then you know maybe I will lose a contest, maybe I won't get a recording contract. Um, there, there are ways in which uh, the recording becomes a, a really a merciless taskmaster. Uh, and I, I think that, that young performers need to be made aware of, of the status of the recording and their relationship to the status of the recording. I mean, it's something that they have to make, uh, uh, make their own peace with. How, uh, how far do I go with uh, thinking about performances that exist uh, where might I begin to do readings that differ considerably from anything anyone has ever heard? Uh, and there I come back to the point I was making about there being thousands of recordings or uh, performances of Hamlet. We don't want to just copy what Laurence Olivier did, as brilliant as that performance might have been. I'm working on a, a, a book on 17th century music. Um, it begins with some attempts at making grammatical sense of that music. Uh, the, the people who wrote about music, the music itself, in the 17th century, and th there were a lot of them who did, somehow or other didn't tell us grammatically how it was supposed to line up. Uh, that was something that begins to happen uh, really very dramatically in the 18th century. The age of reason <clears throat> is also the age of, of Rameau and, and the age of trying to figure out how to really get your hands on the logical structure of harmonies. The 17th century doesn't really do that. And the music often is sort of exuberant in its refusal to follow anything we can see as a logical pattern. Um, that has led a lot of people just to throw up their hands uh, and to say, well, okay, so we can understand the historical context, we can say, well, okay, so the words are doing this, and so then the music goes really wild, and, but that's as, probably as close as we can get. I actually think we can get much closer than that, uh, but only if we are uh, bringing together the various models of musical grammar available at the time in conjunction with the cultural uh, agendas that the music was meaning to satisfy. Uh, and with those two things together, I think we can uh, address this music in the same kind of detail as we can bring to the music of the 18th or 19th centuries. So I'm trying to, uh, to, to do that for the 17th century. I would n not suggest that a young person probably read something like Grout's History of Western Music. Uh, that has put many, many people who are already committed to being musicians to sleep. <laughs> uh, it's not likely uh, to, to draw anyone in. Um, but there are now books that are concerned with music in its cultural context that I think are very exciting and that have uh, quite good track records of bringing people into music.
the one that I wrote that probably has had that effect more than any is my book, uh, Feminine Endings, Music, Gender, and Sexuality, uh, which uh, deals with the ways in which music constructs uh, uh, experiences of sexuality, uh, constructs notions of gender in music r reaching from Monteverdi's earliest operas all the way through to Madonna's songs. Um, and it's aimed at people who do not necessarily read music but who listen uh, and who can uh, take the descriptions and listen and, and, and make sense of them. Uh, but that book has actually served that, uh, that function quite well. I also think of Richard Leppert's book, The Sight of Sound, uh, which is about uh, the paintings uh, that have been made of people making music and what we can learn about the history of music by looking at painting. Uh, also a fascinating book uh, that has uh, caused a lot of people to, uh, to come into the field. If I were starting all over again, and we haven't talked about this, uh, I would also encourage young musicians uh, to listen to uh, music from different parts of the world, uh, regardless of, of uh, where they start from, whether uh, they are uh, 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 avid listeners to rock or piano players or what have you. I think that, uh, that ethnomusicology has uh, brought just an extraordinary change in the way we must think about all music. Uh, Western classical music, which is mostly what I work with, uh, then becomes one kind of musical tradition among many. And although I am not an ethnomusicologist, my exposure to the questions that are asked in ethnomusicology caused me to, to think differently about uh, the music of the Western canon. I was talking earlier about how I went about trying to reconstruct uh, the cultural priorities in the court of Louis XIV in the 17th century. Many of the techniques I'm using are, are drawn from uh, or inspired by people in ethnomusicology. Uh, they have native speakers. Uh, they can go and talk to the musicians. They can say, when you do this, what are you doing? Uh, I don't have that luxury. Those people are gone, and whatever they left behind, you know, we, we have to try to make sense of. We don't even have recordings of them making their music. We don't know, even know what it sounded like when they made it. But uh, we can uh, begin to think of this as a culture uh, in which uh, music is a vital part of the reproduction of that society. Uh, the pleasures uh, that are gained, uh, the ways of thinking about the body, uh, the deportment of musicians, the way mu the musicians are dealt with socially. You know, all of those things are part and parcel of any ethnomusicologist's fieldwork. Um, and I think we uh, can learn an enormous amount by bringing those same questions into our study of, of Western classical music. It only deepens our appreciation of, of the music that we have regarded as our own. Parents have always been concerned that their child mu children might grow up to be musicians. Um, here again, if you look at, at uh, ethnomusicology, if you look even back at that old book by Alan Merriam, uh, you find that in many cultures uh, there is a kind of stigma attached to musicians. All cultures, all societies need musicians. There is no society uh, that does not know how to get along without musicians. We all have this large part of our brain set aside for music making. So we have to have musicians. But nobody wants their kid to be a musician, except maybe other musicians. Um, the whole history of music as, as we know it is, is pockmarked with, uh, with people who you know, just pray that their child will go into medicine. That would have been Berlioz. 
uh, who uh, thought he was going to be a doctor until he was in his first dissecting uh, workshop and passed out cold at the sight of blood, and, and that was the end of his medical career. Law was something many people uh, were forced uh, to consider before they said, no, I, I can't live without being musicians, uh, be, without being a musician. I think that, and I don't know why this is so, uh, there are people for whom music is simply the, the most vibrant, alive part of who they are. And you can't, you can't dissuade such a person uh, without doing tremendous harm. I don't know what it is that causes some people to so gravitate to organized sound that everything else falls into the background. But uh, it seems to me very clearly that that's the case, uh, that there are people who uh, have a predisposition uh, to do music no matter what obstacles are put in their way. There are people who are able to somehow or other manage a real day job uh, to become lawyers or doctors and also maintain uh, their musical practice. Uh, but for people who have that determination, there's really no way of taking that away uh, without, I think, doing considerable damage. Uh, last summer, my husband, uh, who's a, a a trumpet player. He's also a musicologist. He's also on our faculty. But we were in uh, in Spain in a small uh, resort town and there had been fireworks uh, at the end of a festival. And he had been gigging uh, and had his trumpet and was playing. Uh, and people just walk by and sometimes they pause and sometimes uh, they don't. Uh, sometimes uh, they stay for a long time. Very small child, two-year-old girl, comes up and she is her mother cannot move her beyond the trumpet. Uh, it was a, a very small pocket trumpet, with, with coiled up, and she was dazzled and she could not stop uh, listening to the trumpet. So Rob uh, got down and let her touch it. Uh, and then she wanted to be able to play it. And so we all took turns teaching her how to do embouchure and how to blow. Uh, so there was then this huge group of adults all sitting, squatting on the sidewalk going, you know, and so she's taking this thing, and I've never seen such determination. And this two-year-old child finally was able to play notes out of this trumpet. Um, and she did not want to give that trumpet back. She didn't want to go home. She didn't want anything except to be attached to that trumpet. And you know that child was changed that night. That child will insist on being a trumpet player. And she's not going to listen to her teacher who says, little girls don't play trumpets. She's going to be a trumpet player because she made that sort of primal connection with that instrument that may have been the first thing she ever did by choice as an agent. This is who I am. This is who I want to be. It was amazing to watch. Music is a great pleasure for those of us who go into it. It's also tremendously difficult. It requires enormous discipline uh, if you want to do something with it professionally. And if you're going to make that commitment, then you have to know that you have thousands of hours of very, very difficult practice ahead of you. You have the uh, learning of craft, uh, the learning of theory, the learning of everything you need in order to be able to deliver what we will later call creativity, which doesn't come out of nowhere. It requires all of this training, all of this practice. Uh, it requires sometimes falling down and failing. Uh, it, uh, it sometimes does not even pay off for people who have put in all the practice, who are glorious players or composers, 
or musicologists. Uh, sometimes lightning does not strike the people one would anticipate it ought to strike. There isn't any guarantee in it. Um, you have to want to do this so badly that you will risk everything. Uh, investing so much in practice, in learning, in uh, putting yourself up on that stage, uh, in putting yourself in a place where uh, you will be chosen for gigs, uh, doing the PR that is necessary. And then, only if you're lucky, will it pay off as, uh, as a real money-making uh, proposition. But those of us who have set out to do that would, I think, not have it any other way. Thank you for talking to me.